Chapter Four, Part Two, of the Eight Strokes of the Clock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc, Chapter Four, Part Two. Thus. In less than twenty hours, acting on the vague hints supplied by the bearing of a film actor, Serge Renin had touched the very heart of the tragedy by means of purely psychological arguments. Rosandre is alive, he said. Otherwise, Daubrecq would have left the country. The poor thing must be imprisoned and bound up, and he takes her some food at night. We will save him, won't we? Certainly by keeping a watch on him, and, if necessary, but in the last resort, compelling him by force to give up his secret. They follow the woodcutter at a distance, and, on the pretext that the car needed overhauling, engaged rooms in the principal inn at Hutto. Attached to the inn was a small café, from which they were separated by the entrance to the yard, and above which were two rooms, reached by a wooden outer staircase at one side. Daubrecq occupied one of these rooms, and Renin took the other for his chauffeur. Next morning he learned from Adolphe that Daubrecq, on the previous evening, after all the lights were out, had carried down a bicycle from his room, and mounted it, and had not returned until shortly before sunrise. The bicycle tracks led Renin to the uninhabited Chateau de Londres, five miles from the village. They disappeared in a rocky path which ran beside the park down to the Seine, opposite the Jumiege Peninsula. Next night he took up his position there. At eleven o'clock Daubrecq climbed a bank, scrambled over a wire fence, hid his bicycle under the branches and moved away. It seemed impossible to follow him in the pitchy darkness, on a mossy soil that muffled the sound of footsteps. Renin did not make the attempt. But, at daybreak, he came with his chauffeur, and hunted through the park all the morning. Though the park, which covered the side of a hill, and was bounded below by the river, was not very large, he found no clue which gave him any reason to suppose that Rosandre was in prison there. He therefore went back to the village, with the firm intention of taking action that evening, and employing force. This state of things cannot go on he said to Hortense. I must rescue Rosendre at all costs, and save her from the ruffian's clutches. He must be made to speak. He must. Otherwise, there is a danger that we may be too late. That day was Sunday, and Daubrecq did not go to work. He did not leave his room, except for lunch, and went upstairs again immediately afterwards. But at three o'clock, Renin and Hortense, who were keeping a watch on him from the inn, saw him come down the wooden staircase, with his bicycle on his shoulder. Leaning it against the bottom step, he inflated the tires, and fastened to the handlebar a rather bulky object, wrapped in a newspaper. "'By Jove!' muttered Renin. "'What's the matter?' In front of the café was a small terrace, bordered on the right and left by spindle trees planted in boxes, which were connected by a paling. Behind the shrubs, sitting on a bank but stooping forward so that they could see Daubrecq through the branches, were four men. Police, said Renin, what bad luck! If those fellows take a hand, they will spoil everything. Why? On the contrary, I should have thought, yes, they will. They will put Daubrecq out of the way. And then, will that give us Rosandre? Daubrecq had finished his preparations. Just as he was mounting his bicycle, the detectives rose in a body, ready to make a dash for him. But Daubrecq, though quite unconscious of their presence, changed his mind, and went back to his room, as though he had forgotten something. "'Now's the time,' said Renin. "'I'm going to risk it. But it's a difficult situation, and I have no great hopes.' He went out into the yard, and, at a moment when the detectives were not looking, ran up the staircase as was only natural if he wished to give an order to his chauffeur. But he had no sooner reached the rustic balcony at the back of the house 
which gave admission to the two bedrooms, then he stopped. Daubrecq's door was open. Renin walked in. Daubrecq stepped back, at once assuming the defensive. "'What do you want? Who said you could—' "'Silence!' whispered Renin, with an imperious gesture. "'It's all up with you.' "'What are you talking about?' growled the man angrily. "'Lean out of your window. There are four men below on the watch for you to leave. Four detectives.' Daubrecq leaned over the terrace and muttered an oath. "'On the watch for me?' he said, turning round. "'What do I care? They have a warrant.' He folded his arms. "'Shut up with your piffle. A warrant. What's that to me?' "'Listen,' said Renin, "'and let us waste no time. It's urgent. Your name's Daubrecq, or, at least, that's the name under which you acted in The Happy Princess, and under which the police are looking for you as being the murderer of Bourguet, the jeweller, the man who stole a motor-car and forty thousand francs from the World Cinema Company, and the man who abducted a woman at Le Havre.' All this is known and proved. And here's the upshot. Four men downstairs. Myself here. My chauffeur in the next room. You're done for. Do you want me to save you? Daubrecq gave his adversary a long look. Who are you? A friend of Rosandres, said Renin. The other started, and, to some extent, dropping his mask, retorted. What are your conditions? Rosandre whom you have abducted and tormented, is dying in some hole or corner. Where is she? A strange thing occurred, and impressed Renin. Daubrecq's face, usually so common, was lit up by a smile that made it almost attractive. But this was only a flashing vision. The man immediately resumed his hard and impassive expression. And suppose I refuse to speak, he said. So much the worse for you. It means your arrest. I dare say, but it means the death of Rosandre, who will release her. You, you will speak now, or in an hour, or two hours hence at least. You will never have the heart to keep silent and let her die. Daubrecq shrugged his shoulders. Then, raising his hand, he said, I swear on my life that, if they arrest me, not a word will leave my lips. What then? Then save me. We will meet this evening at the entrance to the Parc des Landes, and say what we have to say. Why not at once? I have spoken. Will you be there? I shall be there. Renin reflected. There was something in all this that he failed to grasp. In any case, the frightful danger that threatened Rosandre dominated the whole situation and Renin was not the man to despise this threat, and to persist out of vanity in a perilous course. Rosandre's life came before everything. He struck several blows on the wall of the next bedroom, and called his chauffeur. Adolphe, is the car ready? Yes, sir. Set her going, and pull her up in front of the terrace outside the café, right against the boxes, so as to block the exit. As for you, he continued, addressing Daubrecq, you're to jump on your machine and, instead of making off along the road, cross the yard. At the end of the yard is a passage leading into a lane. There you will be free. But no hesitation and no blundering, else you'll get yourself nabbed. Good luck to you. He waited till the car was drawn up in accordance with his instructions, and, when he reached it, he began to question his chauffeur in order to attract the detective's attention. One of them, however, having cast a glance through the spindle-trees, caught sight of Daubrecq, just as he reached the bottom of the staircase. He gave the alarm, and darted forward, followed by his comrades, but had to run round the car, and bumped into the chauffeur, which gave Daubrecq time to mount his bicycle, and cross the yard unimpeded. He thus had some second start. Unfortunately for him, as he was about to enter the passage at the back, a troop of boys and girls appeared, returning from Vespers. On hearing the shouts of the detectives, they spread their arms in front of the fugitive, who gave two or three lurches, and ended by falling. Cries of triumph were raised. "'Lay hold of him! Stop him!' roared the detectives as they rushed forward. Renin, seeing that the game was up, ran after the others and called out, "'Stop him!' He came up with them, just as Daubrecq, 
after regaining his feet, knocked one of the policemen down and leveled his revolver. Renin snatched it out of his hands. But the two other detectives, startled, had also produced their weapons. They fired. Daubrecq, hit in the leg and the chest, pitched forward and fell. "'Thank you, sir,' said the inspector to Renin, introducing himself. "'We owe a lot to you.' "'It seems to me that you've done for the fellow,' said Renin. "'Who is he?' "'Juan Daubrecq, a scoundrel for whom we were looking.' Renin was beside himself. Hortense had joined him by this time, and he growled. "'The silly fools! Now they've killed him!' "'Oh, it isn't possible!' "'We shall see. But whether he's dead or alive, it's death to Rosendre. How are we to trace her? And what chance have we of finding the place, some inaccessible retreat, where the poor thing is dying of misery and starvation?' The detectives and peasants had moved away bearing Dalbrecq with them on an improvised stretcher. Renin, who had at first followed them, in order to find out what was going to happen, changed his mind, and was now standing with his eyes fixed on the ground. The fall of the bicycle had unfastened the parcel which Dalbrecq had tied to the handlebar, and the newspaper had burst, revealing its contents, a tin saucepan, rusty, dented, battered, and useless. "'What's the meaning of this?' he muttered. "'What was the idea?' He picked it up, examined it. Then he gave a grin and a click of the tongue and chuckled slowly. "'Don't move an eyelash, my dear. Let all these people clear off. All this is no business of ours, is it? The troubles of police don't concern us. We are two modernists, travelling for our pleasure, and collecting old saucepans if we feel so inclined.' He called his chauffeur. Adolphe, take us to the Parc de Londe, by a roundabout road. Half an hour later they reached the sunken track, and began to scramble down it on foot, beside the wooded slopes. The Seine, which was very low at this time of day, was lapping against a little jetty near which lay a warm-eaten, mouldering boat, full of puddles of water. Renin stepped into the boat and at once began to bail out the puddles with his saucepan. He then drew the boat alongside of the jetty, helped Hortense in, and used the one oar which he slipped in a gap in the stern to work her into midstream. "'I believe I'm there,' he said with a laugh. "'The worst that can happen to us is to get our feet wet, for our craft leaks a trifle. But haven't we a saucepan? Oh, blessings on that useful utensil! Almost as soon as I set eyes upon it, I remember that people use those articles to bail out the bottoms of leaky boats. Why, there was bound to be a boat in the London woods. How was it I never thought of that? But of course Dalbrecq made use of her to cross the Seine, and, as she made water, he brought a saucepan. Then Rosandre, asked Hortense, is a prisoner on the other bank, on the Jumiège Peninsula. You see the famous abbey from here. They ran aground on a beach of big pebbles, covered with slime. "'And it can't be very far away,' he added. Dalbrecq did not spend the whole night running about. A towpath followed the deserted bank. Another path led away from it. They chose the second, and, passing between orchards enclosed by hedges, came to a landscape that seemed strangely familiar to them. Where had they seen that pole before, with the willows overhanging it? And where had they seen that abandoned hovel? Suddenly, both of them stopped with one accord. Oh, said Hortense, I can hardly believe my eyes. Opposite them was the white gate of a large orchard, at the back of which, among groups of old, gnarled apple trees, appeared a cottage with blue shutters, the cottage of the happy princess. "'Of course!' cried Renin. "'And I ought to have known it, considering that the film showed both this cottage and the forest close by. And isn't everything happening exactly as in the happy princess? Isn't Daubrecq dominated by the memory of it? The house, which is certainly the one in which Rosandre spent the summer, was empty. He has shut her up there.' But the house, you told me, was in the Seine Inferieure. Well, so are we. To the left of the river, the Eure and the forest of Bretonne. To the right, the Seine Inferieure. 
but between them is the obstacle of the river, which is why I didn't connect the two. A hundred and fifty yards of water form a more effective division than dozens of miles. The gate was locked. They got through the hedge a little lower down, and walked towards the house which was screened on one side by an old wall, shaggy with ivy and roofed with thatch. "'It seems as if there was somebody there,' said Hortense. "'Didn't I hear the sound of a window?' "'Listen.' Someone struck a few chords on a piano. Then a voice arose, a woman's voice, softly and solemnly singing a ballad that thrilled with restrained passion." The woman's whole soul seemed to breathe itself into the melodious tones. They walked on. The wall concealed them from view, but they saw a sitting-room furnished with bright wallpaper and a blue Roman carpet. The throbbing voice ceased. The piano ended with a last chord, and the singer rose and appeared, framed in the window. "'Oh, André whispered Hortense. "'Well,' said Renin, admitting his astonishment. This is the last thing that I expected. Rosandre, Rosandre at liberty, and singing Massenet in the sitting-room of her cottage. What does it all mean? Do you understand? Yes, but it has taken me long enough. But how could we have guessed? Although they had never seen her, except on the screen, they had not the least doubt that this was she. It was really Rosandre, or rather, the happy princess, whom they had admired a few days before, amidst the furniture of that very sitting-room, or on the threshold of that very cottage. She was wearing the same dress. Her hair was done in the same way. She had on the same bangles and necklaces, as in the happy princess, and her lovely face, with its rosy cheeks and laughing eyes, bore the same look of joy and serenity. Some sound must have caught her ear for she leaned over towards a clump of shrubs beside the cottage, and whispered into the silent garden, "'Josh! Josh! Is that you, my darling?' Receiving no reply, she drew herself up, and stood smiling at the happy thoughts that seemed to flood her being. But a door opened at the back of the room, and an old peasant woman entered, with a tray laden with bread, butter, and milk. "'Here, Rose, my pretty one,' I've brought you your supper. Milk, fresh from the cow. And putting down the tray, she continued, Aren't you afraid, Rose, of the chill of the night air? Perhaps you're expecting your sweetheart? I haven't a sweetheart, my dear old Catherine. What next? said the old woman, laughing. Only this morning there were footprints under the window that didn't look at all proper. A burglar's footprints, perhaps, Catherine. Well, I don't say they weren't, Rose, dear, especially as in your calling you have a lot of people round you whom it's well to be careful of. For instance, your friend Alprec, huh? Nice goings on his are. You saw the paper yesterday. A fellow who has robbed and murdered people, and carried off a woman at Le Havre. Hortense and Renin would have much liked to know what Rosandre thought of the revelations, but she had turned her back to them, and was sitting at her supper and the window was now closed, so that they could neither hear her reply nor see the expression of her features. They waited for a moment. Hortense was listening with an anxious face. But Renin began to laugh. Very funny! Really funny! And such an unexpected ending! And we, who were hunting for her in some cave or damp cellar, a horrible tomb where the poor thing was dying of hunger! It's a fact! She knew the terrors of that first night of captivity, and I maintain that, on that first night, she was flung, half dead, into the cave. Only, there you are, the next morning she was alive. One night was enough to tame the little rogue, and to make Dalpec as handsome as Prince Charming in her eyes. For, see the difference, on the films or in novels, the happy princesses resist or commit suicide. But in real life, oh, woman, woman! Yes, said Hortense. But the man she loves is almost certainly dead. And a good thing, too. It would be the best solution. What would be the outcome of this criminal love for a thief and murderer? A few minutes passed. Then, amid the peaceful silence of the waning day, mingled with the first shadows of the twilight, 
they again heard the grating of the window, which was cautiously opened. Rosandre leaned over the garden and waited, with her eyes turned to the wall, as though she saw something there. Presently, Henin shook the ivy branches. Ha! Ah, she said. This time I know you're there. Yes, the ivy's moving. George, George, darling, why do you keep me waiting? Catherine has gone. I am all alone. She had knelt down and was distractedly stretching out her shapely arms, covered with bangles which clashed with a metallic sound. George, George. Her every movement, the thrill of her voice, her whole being expressed desire and love. Hortense, deeply touched, could not help saying, How the poor thing loves him, if she but knew. Ha! Ah, cried the girl, you've spoken, you're there, and you want me to come to you, don't you? Here I am, Georges. She climbed over the window ledge and began to run, while Renin went round the wall and advanced to meet her. She stopped short in front of him, and stood choking at the sight of this man and woman whom she did not know, and who were stepping out of the very shadow from which her beloved appeared to her each night. Renin bowed, gave his name, and introduced his companion. Madame Hortense Daniel, a pupil and friend of your mother's. Still motionless with stupefaction, her features drawn, she stammered. You know who I am? And you were there just now? You heard what I was saying? Renin, without hesitating or pausing in his speech, said, You are Rosandre, the happy princess. We saw you on the films the other evening, and circumstances led us to set out in search of you, to Le Havre, where you were abducted on the day when you were to have left for America, and to the forest of Bretonne, where you were imprisoned. She protested eagerly, with a forced laugh. What is all this? I have not been to Le Havre. I came straight here. Abducted? Imprisoned? What nonsense! Yes, imprisoned, in the same cave as the happy princess. And you broke off some branches to the right of the cave. But how absurd! Who would have abducted me? I have no enemy. There's a man in love with you, the one whom you were expecting just now. Yes, my lover, she said proudly. Have I not the right to receive whom I like? You have the right. You are a free agent. But the man who comes to see you every evening is wanted by the police. His name is Georges d'Aubrec. He killed Bourguet, the jeweler. The accusation made her start with indignation, and she exclaimed, It's a lie! An infamous fabrication of the newspapers. Georges was in Paris on the night of the murder. He can prove it. He stole a motor car and forty thousand francs in notes. She retorted vehemently. The motor car was taken back by his friends, and the notes will be restored. He never touched them. My leaving for America had made him lose his head. Very well. I am quite willing to believe everything that you say, but the police may show less faith in these statements and less indulgence. She became suddenly uneasy and faltered. The police, there's nothing to fear from them. They won't know. Where to find him? I succeeded, at all events. He is working as a woodcutter in the forest of Botonne. Yes, but you. That was an accident. Whereas the police. The words left her lips with the greatest difficulty. Her voice was trembling, and suddenly she rushed at Renin, stammering. He is arrested? I am sure of it, and you have come to tell me. Arrested, wounded, dead perhaps. Oh, please, please! She had no strength left. All her pride, all the certainty of her great love gave way to an immense despair, and she sobbed out. No, he's not dead, is he? No, I feel that he's not dead. Oh, sir, how unjust it all is! He's the gentlest man, the best that ever lived. He has changed my whole life. Everything is different since I began to love him, and I love him so. I love him. I want to go to him. Take me to him. I want them to arrest me, too. I love him. I could not live without him. An impulse of sympathy made Hortense put her arms around the girl's neck and say warmly, Yes, come. He's not dead, I'm sure. Only wounded. And Prince Renin will save him. You will, won't you, Renin? Come, make up a story for your servant. Say that you're going somewhere by train, and that she's not to tell anybody. Be quick. Put on a wrap. We will save him. I swear we will. 
Rosentreia went indoors, and returned almost at once, disguised beyond recognition, in a long cloak and a veil that shrouded her face. And they all took the road back to Ruto. At the inn, Rosentreia passed as a friend whom they had been to fetch in the neighborhood and were taking to Paris with them. Renin ran out to make enquiries and came back to the two women. It's all right. Dalbrecht's alive. They have put him to bed in a private room at the mayor's offices. He has a broken leg and a rather high temperature, but all the same, they expect to move him to Rouen tomorrow, and they have telephoned there for a motor car. And then, asked Rosentre anxiously, Renin smiled. Why, then we shall leave at daybreak. We shall take up our positions in a sunken road, rifle in hand, attack the motor coach, and carry off Georges. Oh, don't laugh, she said plaintively. I'm so unhappy. But the adventure seemed to amuse Renin, and, when he was alone with Hortense, he exclaimed, You see what comes of preferring dishonor to death. But hang it all, who could have expected this? It isn't a bit the way in which things happen in the pictures. Once the men of the woods had carried off his victim, and considering that for three weeks there was no one to defend her, how could we imagine, we who had been proceeding all along under the influence of the pictures, that in the space of a few hours the victim would become a princess in love? Confound that, Georges! I now understand the sly, humorous look which I surprise on his mobile features. He remembered, Georges did, and he didn't care a hang for me. Oh, he tricked me nicely! And you, my dear, he tricked you too. And it was all the influence of the film. They show us at the cinema a brute beast, a sort of long-haired, ape-faced savage. What can a man like that be in real life? A brute, inevitably, don't you agree? Well, he's nothing of the kind. He's a Don Juan, the humbug. You will save him, won't you? said Hortense, in a beseeching tone. Are you very anxious that I should? Very. In that case, promise to give me your hand to kiss. You can have both hands, Renin, and gladly. The night was uneventful. Renin had given orders for the two ladies to be waked at an early hour. When they came down, the motor was leaving the yard and pulling up in front of the inn. It was raining, and Adolphe, the chauffeur, had fixed up the long, low hood and packed the luggage inside. Renin called for his bill. They all three took a cup of coffee. But, just as they were leaving the room, one of the inspector's men came rushing in. "'Have you seen him?' he asked. "'Isn't he here?' The inspector himself arrived at a run, greatly excited. "'The prisoner escaped. He ran back through the inn. He can't be far away.' A dozen rustics appeared like a whirlwind. They ransacked the lofts, the stables, the sheds. They scattered over the neighborhood but the search led to no discovery. "'Ho, oh, hang it all!' said Renin, who had taken his part in the hunt. "'How can it have happened?' "'How do I know?' spluttered the inspector in despair. "'I left my three men watching in the next room. I found them this morning fast asleep, stupefied by some narcotic which had been mixed with their wine, and the Daubrecq bird had flown. Which way? Through the window. There were evidently accomplices, with ropes and a ladder. And— as Dalbrecq had a broken leg, they carried him off on the stretcher itself. They left no traces? No traces of footsteps, true. The rain has messed everything up. But they went through the yard, because the stretcher's there. You'll find him, Mr. Inspector. There's no doubt of that. In any case, you may be sure that you won't have any trouble over the affair. I shall be in Paris this evening, and shall go straight to the prefecture, where I have influential friends." Renin went back to the two women in the coffee-room, and Hortense at once said, "'It was you who carried him off, wasn't it? Please put Rosentreille's mind at rest. She's so terrified.' He gave Rosentreille his arm and led her to the car. She was staggering and very pale, and she said in a faint voice, "'How are we going? And he? Is he safe? Won't they catch him again?' Looking deep into her eyes, he said, Swear to me, Rosandre, that in two months, when he is well and when I have proved his innocence, swear that you will go away with him to America. I swear. And that once there you will marry him. I swear. 
he spoke a few words in her ear. Ha! Ah, she said, may heaven bless you for it. Hortense took her seat in front, with Renin, who sat at the wheel. The inspector, hat in hand, fussed around the car until it moved off. They drove through the forest, crossed the Seine at La Maillere, and struck in the havre rouen road. "'Take off your glove and give me your hand to kiss,' Renin ordered. "'You promised that you would.' "'Oh,' said Hortense, "'but it was to be when Daubrecq was saved.' "'He is saved.' "'Not yet. The police are after him. They may catch him again. He will not be really saved until he is with Rosandre.' "'He is with Rosandre.' he declared. "'What do you mean? Turn round.' She did so. In the shadow of the hood, right at the back, behind the chauffeur, Rosandre was kneeling, beside a man lying on the seat. "'Oh!' stammered Dortens. "'It's incredible! Then it was you who hid him last night, and he was there, in front of the inn, when the inspector was seeing us off. Lord, yes, he was there, under the cushions and rugs.' "'It's incredible!' she repeated, utterly bewildered. "'It's incredible! How were you able to manage it all?' "'I wanted to kiss your hand,' he said. She removed her glove, as he bade her, and raised her hand to his lips. The car was speeding between the peaceful Seine and the white cliffs that border it. They sat silent for a long while. Then he said, "'I had a talk with Daubrecq last night. He's a fine fellow.' and is ready to do anything for Rosandre. He's right. A man must do anything for the woman he loves. He must devote himself to her, offer her all that is beautiful in this world, joy and happiness. And if she should be bored, stirring adventures to distract her, to excite her, and to make her smile, or even weep. Hortense shivered and her eyes were not quite free from tears. For the first time he was alluding to the sentimental adventure that bound them by a tie, which as yet was frail, but which became stronger and more enduring with each of the ventures on which they entered together, pursuing them feverishly and anxiously to their close. Already she felt powerless and uneasy with this extraordinary man, who subjected events to his will, and seemed to play with the destinies of those whom he fought or protected. He filled her with dread, and, at the same time, he attracted her. She thought of him sometimes as her master, sometimes as an enemy against whom she must defend herself, but oftenest as a perturbing friend, full of charm and fascination. End of chapter 4